couple other random topics. Only about 30 slides worth of material left for the module, so I think it's definitely doable for one more lecture, and then that'll get us done a little earlier today to get people on the road sooner. What is it with Mondays and snowing? I don't know. I swear, if this is, so this happens to me every year. Um, the first year I did this, I swear it was the worst weather, driving conditions, and it was always on days I had pharmacology. It's like an hour late a couple of times, and I don't know. I got stuck on 694. Anyway, nightmares I don't want to relive. So uh, I am sensitive to that. So let's get people out a little earlier today, and that'll be good for everyone. Uh, any questions on the recorded modules? If, yeah. Okay, so that's a bit of a debate. Um, generally speaking, they aren't the preferred drug of choice, but there are some trimesters that I think there's some data out there where it is okay to use them situationally. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head where it is, because for a long time they were, and then I think they've gone back on that contraindication. Did I say they're contraindicated in the lecture? Okay. Yeah, um, let me get back. I can email the class about that, because that's a good point, because I actually had a an MD I work with, because we were talking about it, I'm like, well, tryptans aren't preferred, and then he went on some site and he's like, well, this study says right here that they were used without incident. So um, I think there is some literature that actually supports that they can be used situationally. But generally speaking, um, it's it's a strong precaution um, not to use them, but um, I'll get back to you guys. I'll put I'll post something on the forum. That's a good point in an update. Um, another news my, news, my license for Microsoft Office somehow expired, so I can't update anything currently. So I need to go buy a new product. And I bought it through the Bethel office, and they claimed that I would never have to update it, which is why I paid the higher price for the premium product. And now it's completely inactivated. So um, anyway, I'm working on that. So I might have some updates to these slides that I give you verbally. We'll see. Um, epilepsy is an interesting topic. It's uh, got a lot of people worldwide that are affected. There's a fair amount of uh, uh, people in the United States. You know, it's not as huge of a disease, obviously, as hypertension or diabetes, but I still think it's got a pretty big impact. And uh, the, the thing is that people are going to need very specialty care for a lot of uh, the management of this different seizure disorders out there. And a lot of that falls on pharmacology. So we rely very heavily on drugs to prevent seizures and to stop seizures from occurring once they do start. Uh, so again, 2 million Americans, uh, about 1 in 26 uh, people will develop epilepsy. And, or what is that, 1 in 26? That seems really high, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Let's ignore that fact for now. Um, <laughs> treatment response, so this is, this is where I, I know more about what I'm talking about. Um, treatment response is a, is a big deal with epilepsy. So uh, most patients, even on max, doses of multiple drugs, only about 70% of people will get full response from treatment. So epilepsy can be really challenging to meet, um, and 50% of the patients who are treated are going to need more than one drug. So it isn't uncommon to see people who get on one anti-epileptic drug, and that manages their seizure disorder quite well. Uh, that's going to be about half of the patients you work with. The other half, unfortunately, can get really resistant to certain drugs, drugs can stop working, they can end up on cocktails that make them fairly sedated or have heavy side effect profiles associated with them. Of course, we like to avoid that. And this is an area of medicine where we do continue to see new drugs kind of trickle out in the pipeline. There's a couple new ones out. Uh, the problem is new drugs are always, what, expensive, right? So, and we have a lot of drugs that have pretty good proven track records. So to get people on a new drug, it's always gonna be a little bit of an uphill battle with let's try the older therapies first, even though uh, maybe the newer ones might have better safety profiles potentially. Not always, but we actually have some pretty good drugs, and a lot of them have gone generic. There's a big deal with epilepsy when, um, well, let's see, there's probably a change of, change of practice, I don't know, a decade ago, where we had a lot of new therapies come out. So there are all these new drugs on the market that were shown to be safer and um, uh, less frequent dosing and all types of quality of life improvements for the patients taking them. And the old drugs have narrow therapeutic index and some high toxicity associated with them. And so we had this battle going on a while ago where we had these new drugs coming out and people are like, okay, should we take them or not? Fortunately now, all the new drugs have pretty much gone generic. So it's not really a cost issue as much as it used to be. Uh, however, now we're running into that again with this new wave of drugs where we're seeing new drugs come out to replace some of the mid-range drugs we used to have that now have gone generic. And of course, it's drug companies trying to capitalize on uh, replacing those drugs that have gone generic to add new things to that patent or add, you know, different enantium or a slightly more potent version of the same drug. So you get some of that too. Uh, but for the most part, epilepsy is one of those where we do see some, uh, some pretty frequent changes in the therapies that are coming onto market. And where those will get used in the future is hard to say. There's 
a handful of new drugs that are on the market right now that we haven't seen a ton of use with, but that could easily change in five years. Uh, cultural and global stigma. I haven't personally experienced this, but I know in some cultures epilepsy is considered, uh, there is stigma around it, kind of I'd maybe attribute it to how we view some mental health conditions as a society in the United States. Uh, in some cultures, I've heard uh, some Southeast Asian cultures specifically might view it that way. Um, I have some friends who are from the Vietnamese and Hmong community who say that there is some sort of that uh, interpretation in certain parts of that community. So you might encounter that depending on your patients. Um, 10% of people worldwide will have some kind of a seizure during their lifetime. So it's important to understand seizures does not necessarily mean you have epilepsy. So you could have most commonly what's going to happen, right, a febrile seizure for kids, and that's not epileptic. That's a provoked seizure. So that's one of the big differences between epileptic seizures and not epileptic seizures is what's causing the underlying seizure. You can treat them the same way. So let's say somebody has a brain tumor, and that's causing them to seize. You can treat them with anti-epileptic drugs in hope of controlling the seizure, but that's not necessarily epilepsy. Um, however, it could be diagnosed like that because it's a recurring form of seizure. So you get what I'm saying? It's not like the idiopathic form of epilepsy. There's a, a known source, and eventually maybe we can get the person to surgery, and that'll stop the seizures ultimately. Um, what we're talking about here today, mostly with the drugs, is the idiopathic causes. So I don't really know what's causing epilepsy. There's thoughts that um, certain uh, genetics can cause it. Um, and lead to uh, increased rate, rates of epilepsy, but no one kn knows exactly what causes idiopathic epilepsy. And then we have the other sets of causes, which are going to be more things like post-stroke, so parts of the brain got damaged permanently and the person has a seizure disorder because of it, uh, trauma, uh, perinatal issues, some kind of a congenital issue that, that occurred during the birthing process or shortly after, uh, infection, so severe sepsis with, uh, it could be related to, and that could be like an infarction type situation too, where you have blood flow issues similar to a stroke. And of course, um, tumors and, and uh, different types of cancers can lead to uh, seizure disorders as well. Highest incidence of epilepsy is in very young and very old patients and uh, significant lifestyle impact for people, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Okay, uh, sudden change in behavior that is a consequence of brain dysfunction. So seizures, epileptic seizures, electrical hyper, hyper synchronization of neuronal networks. Um, provoked seizure would be something that is caused due to a metabolic disturbance, drug withdrawal or overdose or other acute neurologic um, disorder. So something is acutely happening, provoking the seizure. Uh, a great example of this would be alcohol withdrawal seizure. That's not epilepsy, that's because they're withdrawing from the drug. Uh, metabolic seizures. Could be any type of um, lab abnormality that might cause seizure. Uh, sometimes certain uh, like really high potassium can not only cause cardiac issues, it can cause seizure disorders as well. Uh, low electrolytes sometimes can too. We talked about hypo um, hyponatremia, which can cause seizures in addition to the psychiatric presentations. Um, one thing that I didn't ever learn about in school, and hopefully somebody's mentioned it to you before, but if not, here you're hearing about it now. Psychogenic non-epileptic seizures or pseudo-seizures. You guys talked about these a little bit. So physically resembling an epileptic seizure, not noticed on an EEG. Uh, these people oftentimes get treated or can get treated like they have epilepsy, but ultimately you need that EEG to rule that out. Um, and I think this is, I don't know if I'd say this is a relatively new thing, but I we've seen lots of people come in and out of the hospital. We have some frequent flyers that come in and they pseudo-seize in public locations, so somebody sees a person, and you know, you're, you're a general member of the public, you don't, don't have a medical background, you see somebody in what it looks like having a seizure, you're gonna call 911. EMS shows up, they take the person to the ER, they give them a whole bunch of benzodiazepines to try and get their seizure under control. Turns out they aren't actually seizing. So um, a good neurologist or somebody who has experience with this can tell, so different movements, and you know, if you can, if you can stimulate the patient in certain ways and they respond, that's, that's a good sign that it's not actually a real seizure. But some pseudo seizures can really um, resemble a, a, a full on um, epileptic seizure type situation. So it's difficult to treat. But if you treat somebody with an AED for pseudo seizure, you aren't going to do any good. Um, you have to treat them for the underlying psychological disorder uh, or substance abuse disorder, otherwise, it's not going to have any effect. Uh, I don't know anything about EEGs, but here's a cool image. Uh, other than that, um, you can you can look at brain waves and figure out if somebody's having a seizure. Uh, so this comes in handy if you I don't know who who in here is interested in neurology or if you're interested in critical care, you might get to get see some of this more often. Um, like for our uh, like we have a neuro center at Abbott, 
And so our post-stroke patients are post-intracranial hemorrhage patients. A lot of times they're sedated, they're paralyzed in certain situations as well. And you wouldn't be able to see the, the classic signs of a seizure in a patient like that. So they do EEG monitoring and uh, they can see on the, of course, on the scan if there's some sort of waveform that's coming up that looks like a seizure versus normal brain activity. And so there is certain pools of evidence within critical care, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more um, in the summer, about prophylactic seizure uh, drugs that we can use to prevent this type of situation in a neuro patient specifically. Um, that gets a little bit more into critical care. It's kind of blurring the line between neuro and neurocritical care, but kind of goes with stroke care and post-stroke care as well. Uh, but it's all pretty much the same drugs we're using, so that's the good news. Uh, and we'll get to those in a few slides here. So classifications of seizures, you have partial and generalized. Partial means that uh, our focal seizures would be uh, classified as the three here. So simple, complex, or um, uh, secondary, secondary uh, partial seizures. Then you have generalized seizures, which would be kind of what we think of as the full body movement disorder, so tonic clonic seizures where you're, you're having a lot of rigidity and contractility going on. Um, partial seizures can be really all over the board. You can have movement you know, heavily, heavily involved movement disorder with them. You can also have uh, a very, very mild and subtle side effects, or not, well, I guess it would be a side effect of the seizure. Um, I used to work with a technician who would, a pharmacy tech, and she would just kind of collapse on the counter, and you wouldn't really notice because she almost looked like she was, she had her head up and she was, I don't know, counting something or writing something, and you wouldn't notice until she started interacting with patients, and you'd hear patients getting verbally upset with her. This is when I was in college and I worked at a, a pharmacy by my house where I grew up, and they, you know, you'd be like, why are, the, why is somebody yelling at one of my technicians? It's not really funny, but kind of was at the time. And you go over there and you realize, yeah, she just had a seizure and she's post ictal and she can't comprehend the situation. She's not making any sense. She's trying to talk to this person, but she's just asking them why over and over again. Uh, and it <laughs> ends up being that not not great for patients. She she had a whole bunch of yeah issues that she wasn't taking medication and stuff like that. This is a good example of why you should. Um, keep on your, your anti-epileptic regimens. But the point is, is that you can have a subtle a subtle looking seizure that's um, not, you know, the, the, what you'd see on TV where somebody's just kind of jerking all over the place. All right. This is uh, some statistics. This is a pretty old uh, group of data, but I still think it's, it's relatively accurate as far as the presentations. That's a nice diagram too. So it shows you a little bit, uh, of the, so here's the diagram of partial versus generalized. So partial being a little bit more uh, common than generalized seizures, and then the, the pop percentage of population who would fall into those categories too. This, I don't care you know any of this for my exam, it's just on here for your reference. There's classifications of epileptic seizures on here, so what exactly do people experience during a seizure? Again, I don't, I don't care you know that, but it's there. I don't know if it helps you in another class or if you guys will go over it, I'm sure, in other areas of neuro if you haven't already. Um, phases of tonic-clonic seizures to what we're talking about here, so when I talk about postictal, um, auras, sometimes usually not for uh, tonic-clonic seizures. Sometimes people get auras for other types of seizures, though. Uh, but anyway, there's the different types of uh, um, phases there and what time frame you're looking at. So postictal phases can, can really vary depending on the type of seizure. And again, sometimes 30 minutes, sometimes multiple hours uh, when somebody's postictal. Okay, drugs. Anti-epileptic drugs have a number of mechanisms of action, but they all kind of do similar things. So you can see here, this diagram is showing a specific receptor that is working on um, releasing different neurotransmitters, specifically looking at NMDA receptors, which is going to be, NMDA receptors generally have to do with the way your body communicates between the central and peripheral nervous system. And then you also have uh, um, different uh, neurotransmitters that are releasing, so you have, or different uh, channels too, you have sodium channels, you have potassium channels, you have uh, glutamate as a neurotransmitter, and then again, you just have potassium as a neurotransmitter. A lot of these drugs work on sodium channels, so what they're going to do is, generally speaking, they're going to block this sodium channel from opening, which prevents depolarization, and ultimately that has an inhibitory effect. So this is an excitatory synapse, as you can see labeled here. So when this is firing and going crazy, and 
that's where you're getting all this activity and stimulation causing the seizure. Uh, and the overactivity of that is, of course, where we see seizures versus general normal brain activity that would cause you know, the things we do normally on a daily basis that we need these transmitters for. Uh, overdone, of course, you get uh, serious complications with that. In this case, most of these drugs are working on inhibiting the excitatory processes. So they're going to prevent this whole process from working, and they do it upstream mostly at the sodium channel. Now you can see there's a couple other drugs that work a little bit differently. So um, levetiracetam works on a different subtype of receptor that prevents vesicle release. Similar overall concept, slightly different mechanism. Um, topiramate works directly on this specific subtype of uh, potassium and sodium uh, transporter. Thelomate has a, a separate activity on the NNDA receptor. And gabapentin pregabalin, which are actually not really useful as anti-epileptic drugs at all anymore, um, but they were developed for that purpose, are on this slide as well, and they can work that way. They're more used for neuropathic pain nowadays. Uh, the other side of the coin is inhibitory synapses, so potentiating inhibitory activity within the brain as opposed to working against the excitatory pathways. And what we see most commonly done here is going to be some of the drugs are a little bit more obscure, like vigabatrin and teagabine. Um, Thelomate, topiramate, you'll notice, are on both slides here, so they have kind of a dual mechanism of action. They work both ways. Uh, barbiturates and uh, benzodiazepines. One thing you'll notice about all these drugs, for the most part, with maybe the exception of zonisamide, isn't as sedating. These are pretty sedating medications. So if you're potentiating the body's inhibitory processes, you're going to likely cause some sedation. So it's an easy way to remember if you're trying to group things together in mechanisms that the drugs, benzos, barbiturates, you probably know those already. We've talked about them a little bit. Not necessarily barbiturates, but you guys are probably familiar with the term maybe. Uh, but they're, sedate, they're sedatives, uh, and they will make people especially if they're taking them regularly, have a difficult time functioning in society. So the thing to remember is that some of these drugs that work about inhibitory processes are not necessarily the best for a day-to-day -day activity for our patients. So it's easier to um, keep a patient functioning at a job or school or wherever it may be uh, with one of these medications. But then again, you do have some, some outliers like uh, topiramate uh, can be used sometimes uh, for that. It's a little bit sedating, not quite as much. Zonisamide is generally a fairly well-tolerated drug. So we have some rules, some exceptions to that rule, but then some like the benzos, which are used um, uh, for anxiety, and they also will generally cause uh, people to be fairly sedated. OK. All right, so the drugs I've kind of the, uh, well, okay, how do I explain this? Epilepsy is uh, not a, a an easy roadmap. There's not a quick way to say, okay, this is first line, second line, third line. It's really going to depend on the provider. There's there's guidelines out there, but a lot of people will say, well, this group of drugs generally is, you know, if you pick any of them, that's ones to start with. Or this one's the gold standard because we know it works really well. Well, the problem is that gold standard might not be the best tolerated, and maybe it works well because it has the most studied evidence behind it, but maybe there's newer drugs that are showing more promise and better side effect profiles. So it gets to be difficult because if you have a patient who's not tolerating something, but it's controlling their seizures, what do you do? Do you taper them off? Do you decrease their dose? Do you risk having a seizure by switching their medication? It can be challenging, especially if you get them controlled on one specific agent. So what I've done is I've put these in the order that usually I see our neurologist use them as far as what drugs they prefer uh, and what drugs I think have, if you look at the overall grand scheme of things, are probably the best tolerated and have the most broad spectrum of approach and are going to be useful for the most amount of patients. So it's a little bit of my opinion here, but it's also what I've seen in practice. And I think it falls into play with what's currently done. Now, again, you could go to different institutions and different neurology practices, and they're like, ah, oh, Chad said use Keppra first line. We don't do that. Well, uh, we do at Abbott, so <laughs> that's all I can tell you. <clears throat> all right, so levetiracetam is Keppra. It's a broad-spectrum anti-epileptic drug. And um, I, I added these slides. I used to talk about FDA-approved indications versus not, and everybody just got confused by them. Um, a lot of these anti-epileptic drugs were originally approved for partial seizures only, and Keppra is one of them. But over time, because people get resistant and our drugs for general seizure disorders just aren't that great overall, people just started trying them, found out actually they work quite well for, for, more, for a more broad spectrum. So levetiracetam or Keppra has pretty much been studied in every seizure type 
known, um, and it will work well for most of them. Um, you can even use it to stop an acute seizure. It comes as an IV form, and we actually use that as our second line agent, which is very surprising for people who come to our hospital after they practice other places. They're like, why do you guys use Keppra? Well, there's studies that show it works, and it's relatively safe to give in really high doses. IV, and you can give it quickly. Uh, so anyway, um, pros, it doesn't really have any drug interactions. We're going to talk, I'm going to talk about a, a lot about drug interactions because this is a, a subpopulation where you have that issue coming up a lot. A lot of these drugs interact with each other, and so the question is, how do you tailor that? If you actually go and look at some of the drug monographs for some of the medications we're going to talk about, they'll give you very specific instructions for how to dose a medication or start a patient on a new medication depending on what other anti-epileptic drugs they're on. So if you're starting somebody on Keppra, the nice thing is you don't really have to worry about that because it really doesn't interact with anything. So it's a good add-on to existing therapy. It's also a good first drug to start. And if you're concerned about interacting with other types of medications, non-anti-epileptic drugs, uh, it's another good choice. So again, we like it for a number of reasons. That's a big one. Uh, minimal side effects. We're going to talk about a couple of these here. Overall, fairly well-tolerated medication comes PO and IV. Another nice thing, if your patient uh, comes in seizing because they ran out of Keppra and missed four doses, you can IV load them in 30 minutes and get them back up to a blood concentration that's fairly normal. You can't do that with every drug. There's a couple others that you can do that with, uh, but that's a really nice advantage to Keppra. <clears throat> Uh, cons, it's twice daily dosed. Uh, it does come as an XR formulation. It's a little bit more expensive. Um, it's renally eliminated, so you do have to renally dose adjust it for elderly patients, but you can still give it. Um, you can give it to pretty weak kidneys. I can't remember what the cutoff is off the top of my head, but it's not a huge issue, but it would be something to consider. Uh, and then the biggest side effect with it are behavioral related things. So people get some irritation, angry, behavior, aggressive behavior. Um, for kids who are taking Keppra for epilepsy, a lot of times you'll see biting and hitting and outbursts where you previously didn't necessarily have that. Uh, and it's a pretty common side effect. About 10% of patients will experience this. It doesn't matter if you've had a mental health history or not. So if you have somebody who is taking an antidepressant, that's not a reason not to give them Keppra. Uh, but it would be something to make sure they're aware of. I think just keep an eye on your behavior, tell their, you know, if they have family members or loved ones they're interacting with regularly to uh, be aware of that side effect. Um, sedation. Keppra is not generally terribly sedating. However, if you give somebody a huge dose of it all at once, uh, it can be. So we titrate it up kind of slowly. Um, but you can get it to a decent dose relatively quickly compared to uh, specifically some of the other drugs we're going to talk about and, and very much so the next drug we're going to talk about here. Uh, Lamotrigine or Lamictal is another broad spectrum anti-epileptic drug. It's a, another very well tolerated medication. Uh, but if it's started appropriately. So, well, or, sorry, Lamictal has this odd side effect with it where it causes a rash and it has been, has been linked to Stevens Johnson syndrome. You guys talk about SJS. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really rare to see SJS, but the rash is actually pretty common and it can be kind of nasty. So, we titrate it really slowly over two months. So it takes about two months to titrate somebody up from base Lamictal dose all the way to the top. Um, and if you quit cold turkey, like if you stop your drug for a week because you ran out and then go get your prescription refilled and start up on your high dose again, you're equally at risk for that incident from recurring. So basically, I think the rule of thumb is four days if you missed it. It's got a pretty long half-life, so it's 25 to 33 hours. So it'll stay in your body for a while, which is nice if you miss a dose. Uh, but I think we say if it's four, it's been over four days, we retitrate somebody fully, which can be really devastating if that's what you're controlling your seizures. So you might have to bridge somebody with something else that's shorter, uh, that has a shorter onset of action. Uh, it's not renally dosed, but you do have to use caution, so they think that there could be some issue with elimination in patients with renal dysfunction. It's a loose recommendation. Um, it is the drug of choice in pregnancy. It's generally the one that they recommend. Sometimes they'll switch patients off of whatever they're on to uh, lamotrigine during pregnancy or pre prior to pregnancy, ideally, if they're gonna, uh, if they know that they're gonna try for a child sometime in the near future. So anyway, the rash is the biggest thing. Drug interactions, um, this is a weird one because it's not um, cytochrome P450 metabolized. However, it's thought that it does have, well, it's been observed in clinical studies that blood concentrations change with concurrent administration of other anti-epileptic drugs. So valproic acid, which we'll talk about here in a second, um, lower dose requirements overall for lamotrigine. Um, things that induce enzymes generally might have higher uh, needs for dose. And oral contraceptives increase metabolism. Why this stuff occurs, it must have some sort of liver pathway to do because this is all related to liver enzyme. Valproic acid might have to do with protein binding. 
potentially. Um, Velproic acid is heavily protein bound, so if you have two drugs competing for binding spots on albumin within the plasma, you get a uh, some of it's getting knocked off, so your free levels are going to go up for both drugs. So you dose reduce both so that you have um, a lower amount or a more normal amount, I should say, of free drive available. Other side effects. This is mostly dose related, and it's mostly due to improper titration. So generally, it's again well tolerated medication, but um, tremor, dizziness, involuntary movement disorders, potentially ataxia and insomnia have been some of the more common reported ones with lamotrigine, but again, one of the better tolerated medications. The titration guide. I'm not gonna. I don't want you to know how to dose somebody up. I just want you to know that it has to be titrated. Uh, if you are ever starting somebody on lamotrigine, there's really Drug monograph should spell it out very clearly how to titrate somebody up. Like if you do urgent care and you're like, this person's out, they need to restart, and you want to get them get them started, it's, it's pretty clearly documented in, in any you know legitimate drug monograph how to do that. <laughs> um, Velproic acid or divalproex or aka brand name Depakote or Depakine or some other Depas. Anyway, uh, Depakote is probably the most common name you'll hear for this drug, but Velproic acid is ultimately what the molecule is. Uh, it's a broad-spectrum anti-epileptic drug. A lot of people consider this to be the gold standard for current anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, problem is, I don't think its side effects are all that great, and it's contraindicated in pregnancy. But um, let's talk about the pros first. So again, considered to be a fairly effective agent uh, for most types of seizures. It does have an IV form available. So you know, Keppra or Levetiracetam has an IV form. Valproic acid does. Uh, Lamotrigine does not have an IV form available. There's no renal adjustment needed for valproic acid, so it's a nice one to use in elderly patients potentially. Uh, the extended release product can be dosed once daily, so you usually dose it once daily at night and you can get somebody through the entire day with that dose, so it's relatively convenient. It's been around quite a while, it's, it's reasonably uh, affordable. I would say um, levetiracetam and lamotrigine have, are generic now, but they still probably fall into that scale of more expensive generics, not necessarily like the dirt cheap generics like you'd see for maybe an antihypertensive med. Um, cons, contraindicated in pregnancy, one to two percent chance of spina bifida. Yeah, if you do have somebody who absolutely has to be on this drug, and sometimes you might, you might have a pregnant patient where it's like it's too risky to put them through the possibility of having a seizure during their pregnancy because that actually has much higher complications associated with it than taking any anti-epileptic drug. So um, supplement with folic acid, and again, the, the, the risk is pretty low, but it is a really well-documented association with velproic acid. So if you can switch somebody off VPA or velproic acid, you're going to want to do that uh, during a pregnancy, prior to the pregnancy if you can. Um, it's an enzyme inhibitor, and it's highly protein-bound, meaning it's full of drug interactions. So this is one of those drugs that you'll look at the dosing monograph for, and you'll see, okay, I want to start this person on velproic acid, and it tells you, Okay, if they're on this drug, this drug, or this drug, start here. It's on these three drugs, start here. It gets kind of confusing. And the only thing to, that I just recommend you remember, because most people aren't going to be in a situation doing this unless you go into neurology or epilepsy specifically, which some of you guys may, um, but it is pretty clearly labeled on a lot of the dosing protocols how to dose this with other drugs. At first, we didn't really know, and so when this drug was out initially, it's like, well, people kind of had to figure it out on their own based on what they thought the kinetics would be and say, well, it's empirically dose reduced by about 30%. It's going to interact with this med, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the companies and studies have come out now to, to formulate some pretty solid recommendations for how to dose these kind of medications appropriately, which is really helpful for clinicians, I think. Um, side effects. Tremor, alopecia, 25% hair loss that happens in both men and women. Uh, weight gain, thrombocytopenia, and other blood dyscrasia. So CBC monitoring is important with this one. <laughs> Irregular menses in women. Generally, not the best tolerated medication. 25% alopecia is going to be something that a lot of patients are going to come back and say, is there something else I can try? Um, if they don't get any of those side effects, the drug's really effective. So uh, kudos to them. But for the you know people that just can't tolerate that or have it to an extent that's, or maybe they're getting such a bad tremor from it, that's a really common side effect too is the tremor. Um, that can be something that we just need to consider switching them off something else. Uh, it is hepatotoxic and overdose, so if you have somebody, we're going to talk about this drug's role in certain mental health disorders. It's an important um, uh, which is it? important therapeutic option for people with bipolar disorder as well. So if you've got somebody with epilepsy and comorbid mental health, it's maybe not the best because if they do have access to a large amount of it and overdose on it, it is hepatotoxic. But there is a reversal agent called levocarnitine, which can help metabolize it quicker, but it's not the, not the best for having on hand if somebody is possibly suicidal. Whereas you could take a ton of Keppra 
uh, or a ton of Lamotrigine even, assuming you've been titrated up on it, and there's probably not a huge risk. Keppra is probably a lot safer than Lamotrigine. Um, monitoring uh, liver function tests, there's been some associations of rare liver toxicity with this, even at normal doses. So again, overdose, much more likely, but uh, you're still recommending to get baseline LFTs and monitor LFTs. Uh, ammonia CBC uh, would be other things to, to get monitoring on fairly regularly with BPA. All right, topiramate or topamax is another broad spectrum one. Some people think this one's a little bit weaker in efficacy compared to the first three we talked about, but it still has good evidence for all uh, the seizure disorders we already talked about. Uh, pros, it does cause some weight loss, which I put as a pro. Most patients might find this as a pro. It might be a con depending on the patient population you're working with, of course. So just something to keep in mind that it does cause <coughs> weight loss. Uh, this drug's got the nice nickname of Dopamax because it makes people, it has a side effect of causing psychomotor slowing, slowed thinking, speech difficulty. It can happen in up to 30% of patients, at least to a certain degree. So a lot of people will take Dopamax and just feel like they, they can't think as fast as they could before, and it becomes a pretty big stumbling block for their day-to-day -day life. So it can limit its role overall, but assuming that side effect, we put that one aside, the other cons of it, it's renally adjusted, which we can get around if we want to. It does have some CYP2C uh, enzyme, of a variety of them, inhibition, and it also induces CYP3A4, so it's going to cause a lot of drug interactions. It's got twice daily dosing, which generally is okay, but it's not as good as once daily. Um, side effect profile, you're looking at uh, ocular pain. is something that's kind of weirdly associated with topiramate. Metabolic acidosis, hyperthermia uh, can occur. Anorexia, sedation, kidney stones, paresthesia, okay, you get the point. The big one is uh, slow thinking, though. That's the one I, I really want you to remember. The rest of them are a little bit more unusual and rare. Phenytoin or Dilantin is another broad spectrum. This is one of the older medications. So I would say the first four we just talked about are considered a bit more new school as far as they've come out within the last 10, 20 years. Uh, Phenytoin is a pretty old drug, and it's been around a while. We have a pretty good track record with it, but it's not the best as far as its therapeutic index. The other ones, you can tolerate a fair amount. In fact, we don't even do really level monitoring on the other four drugs because there's no reason to. Uh, and that's, a, that's actually something I've got another slide on, so I'll get to that in a minute. But um, So hold that thought. I'll, I'll try and hold that thought, at least not jump ahead too much. But the point is with phenytoin, it's got a much more narrow therapeutic index. So getting the dose correct can be more challenging. And if you overshoot, you're going to get toxicity a lot faster than you would with any of the other drugs. So um, the uh, pros, it's an old drug. It's fairly effective. Uh, it's got a lot of data behind it. It's got an IV form called phosphenytoin. Actually, phenytoin itself comes IV. But the, the way that they put it into IV solution requires this weird adjunct they have to add to it to keep it stable. And that adjunct has some, va it, it can cause some vasculitis on infusion. Uh, if you give it IM to somebody, it can cause pretty severe um, tissue damage in some cases. So phosphenytoin is this reformulation of it. And phosphenytoin is actually dosed in terms of phenytoin equivalents. So it's basically the same drug, even though it's not. So when you read, if you look at a phosphenytoin vial, it'll say 80 milligrams PE equivalent, meaning that that's 80 milligrams of phenytoin. So you can dose it sort of a one-to-one -one that way. That's helpful, I think, for people trying to do this. If they're trying to like load somebody, if somebody comes in. But the point is, is that you have an easily, easily accessible, relatively inexpensive IV formulation of this drug available. And um, that's another good drug we can use to, to get somebody uh, up to a, a decent level on anti-epileptic drug fairly quickly. So remember our three drugs so far, we've talked about IV, levetiracetam, valproic acid, and now phenytoin. So some options we have. Um, cons, neurotherapeutic index. So free versus total levels are important. This is really highly protein-bound drug. <clears throat> so if you have a patient who is um, possibly alcoholic or malnourished and they have, or maybe just elderly with a slightly lower albumin than normal, um, they're probably going to have a higher free level. So sometimes it's important to get both. You can do a calculation from the total level, but most labs will do a free and a total level at the same time. I highly recommend getting a free level if you're checking out a penny tone level. Drug interactions, strong CYP2C, uh, tip, CYP2C general 
uh, and 3A inducer. So it induces a wide, wide variety of enzymes. This is probably one of the more common enzyme inducers out there. There's not a lot of drugs that really have clinically substantial enzyme induction potential. Phenytoin is one of them, and because it's a reasonably popular anti-epileptic drug, it's probably the most common one you'll see in a day-to-day -day environment, uh, general medicine environment. Um, side effect profile. Uh, oops, I'm on the wrong slide here. Oh, no, there it is. Okay, sorry. Um, Dose-related, so the, the things that people will see as the toxicity creeps up a little bit are nystagmus, slurred speech, and ataxia. Uh, when it gets a little bit higher than that, dizziness, drowsiness, um, over time, you might see hirsutism, so uh, hair growth in, in other areas that you probably wouldn't desire hair growth in. Um, gingival hypertrophy, which is gums growing over the teeth. Uh, hypersensitivity is possible. Um, Long-term, uh, some osteomalacia, cerebral atrophy, uh, not the best drug long-term, and uh, has just a whole slew of side effects associated with it. Assuming you can keep it in its therapeutic range, it might be uh, acceptable for most people, the side effect profile, but over time it can be problematic. It does have some teratogenicity associated with it too. It's considered category D. And I'll talk about phenytoin levels when I talk about drug levels in general in a second, so we'll get back to that. Carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine, I put on the same slide. They're spelled a little bit differently. That's not a typo. They're it's not just oxcarbamazepine, it's oxcarbazepine. But they're basically analogs of the same thing. Uh, they work the same way. Um, oxcarbazepine is generally the newer agent and it's better tolerated. So oxcarbazepine is trileptol and carbamazepine is tegretol. Side effect profile, they generally have a shared side effect profile of rashes, hyponatremia, which tends to be a little bit worse actually with the newer drug. But the drowsiness, dizziness, blurred vision, ataxia, that's more pronounced with carbamazepine than it is oxcarbazepine. Um, SIP inducers, uh, they both induce metabolism. And uh, to a more substantial degree, carbamazepine actually induces its own metabolism. Oxcarbazepine has a slightly different metabolic pathway, even though it is a slight enzyme inducer. Um, carbamazepine is a much more substantial one. So again, we've talked about two drugs now that are pretty common in the anti-epileptic world that uh, cause enzyme induction. So that's a, a difference in what we normally see as drugs that inhibit SIP, the cytochrome P50 system. These drugs will induce it and cause it to metabolize faster. So with carbamazepine, if you give somebody, start somebody on that, you're actually probably going to have to increase your dose differently and maybe a little bit more, not necessarily exponentially, but not, not as linear as you would with a standard medication. Because as somebody gets more on board, they're going to metabolize it faster as it ramps up the, the SIP system in their body. Both are dosed about two to four times daily and have a variety of formulations, including extended release available, meaning they can be used for, um, you know, you can get it down to once daily on some of these medications, depending on how you're dosing it and what formulations you're using. But two times a day is pretty common, even for the extended release. Trileptol is a little bit more renally eliminated, uh, and these drugs are contraindicated for patients with absence seizures because they can exacerbate those. Uh, other broad spectrum, and absence, people say, is that, is that the correct pronunciation? That's what people always told it to me when I learned epilepsy, so I don't know if people just call it absence or not, but I was always told absence by our people who talk epilepsy, so that's what I say. Maybe it's wrong. Sounds fancy. All right. <laughs> so those are the primary ones that I think are probably the most clinically, clinically relevant. Now, of course, if you work with epilepsy patients, you're going to see people on all types of combinations of these drugs. So that's not to say these drugs are just not used at all, because they really are. Um, I just don't have as much to say about them. And you know, for the purposes of this class, I'd rather you focus on the ones that I see being the more common ones people take on a regular basis. All right, a um, couple of things to point out. Uh, these are all broad spectrum. So these would fall under the same category. We could use these for any type of seizure. Zonisamide is a little bit newer drug. It's recently been studied in is a monotherapeutic option for generalized seizures, but it was approved for partial. So kind of the same pathway a lot of the, these other drugs we just talked about took. It's got some uh, adverse effects that I put on there. Uh, Felbomate, primidone, I don't really have much to say about those specifically. They're more obscure. Primidone is a little bit of an older medication. Uh, it's pretty sedating, and it actually has the opposite effect in kids, surprisingly. Phenobarbital and benzos are broad-spectrum anti-epileptic drugs, and we're going to talk about those during psych, during sedatives and hypnotics in more, much more detail. 
but you could theoretically be in a situation where somebody takes <coughs> chronic, and phenobarbital is a barbiturate, by the way, um, people take a chronic phenobarb or benzodiazepine for seizure control. It's rare, but in somebody who can't get controlled any other way, you might see that. Now, that person's probably going to be relatively sedated most of the time they're on their drugs, so that's the problem. These are going to be the most sedating medications out of all the ones we've talked about today. And really, their role is much more in acute seizure management. So these are our go-to, not necessarily phenobarb, that's a bit old school, but benzodiazepines are our go-to for acute epileptic events. So status epilepticus, acute seizures, we're going to use a benzodiazepine first line to control that. And then we want to switch the person to a longer-acting medication as soon as we can, because benzos aren't a sustainable seizure management strategy. Um, ethosuximide, I just put on there at the very bottom. Uh, it's absence only, and it has some side effects with it. So it's a really obscure medication. Absence seizures are not common. And what I'd like you to know on this slide is really just Zonogram. That's the only one I care about. I'm not going to test you on Felomate or Primadon. Um, you might, if you want to know them for, for the purposes of knowing their broad spectrum, that's probably the extent that I think the general person would need to know. If you're really interested in epilepsy and want more information, I can, I can send you more if you want. <clears throat> All right, some additional AEDs for partial seizures only. Um, the one I really want you to know is the first one, lacosamide. That's a pretty common medication. It's a um, partial seizure medication, but I think this one's getting more play in general, too. So I don't know if I'd consider it a, a medication that I would put a gold stamp on or star on or whatever you want to say uh, for generalized seizures, but I think it's getting more play. And one of the reasons probably is because it comes IV. And any anti-epileptic drug that's IV available is going to be something somebody at some point tries to stop a seizure with. Because if you get, this happens in peds a lot, it seems like, where you get kids who come in who just have uncontrolled epilepsy and nothing works. And um, if you watch the anesthetic lecture, I've actually seen, I did a rotation at Children's and spent some time in the ER, and they actually had a patient who came in, and the only thing that would work was propofol drips on the patient to actually get them sedated enough to stop the seizure. Um, so in those patients, they might just be throwing the kitchen sink at them and say, well, it's trilocosamide, it's IV, it's not going to hurt them. The side effects are relatively well tolerated. Um, one thing about lacosamide is it is a controlled substance, and actually it's a newer drug too. And one thing I'll just throw out there because it's relevant at this time is a lot of the newer drugs coming out for epilepsy are getting weak controlled statuses. So they're getting like controlled 5 status, which is the lowest control you can have. So controlled status is just to review C3, uh, C2 three, C through uh, 5. 2 is being like, you know, narco opioid narcotics or stimulants like Adderall and Ritalin are C2s. Um, C4s would be like benzodiazepines like lorazepam, Ativan, uh, um, Xanax, things like that, Valium. And C5s, and the things that are C5s are like Sudafed's a C5 in Minnesota, for example. But a lot of these anti-epileptic drugs are fitting into that C5 category. So lacosamide's a C5. Um, there's another newer one we're going to talk about as well that's a C5. It just makes things a little bit more tricky when it comes to prescribing. There's more tracking. The DEA gets involved. From the hospital perspective, we have to securely store it and manage it, and there has to be a chain of custody whenever we dispense it. Um, so it gets a little bit interesting, and I'll talk, I'll talk about that more on the, the slide of the new drugs here in a second. But really, the other drugs on this slide, uh, piagabine, uh, vigabatran, and rufinamide, not super common. You might Again, you might see them, but they aren't really the, the, the go-to agents. They're going to be adjunct therapy for um, hard-to-manage partial seizure patients. Okay, monitoring levels. Usually when we're looking at AED levels, we're looking at trough levels. So you want to do a level and time it before they're going to take their dose. So if they take their dose at 8 a.m., get a level at 7.30 or something like that. Uh, so if you're ever ordering a level, make sure you remember trough for AED. That's pretty common for most drug levels we're looking at. Usually with the newer drugs like um, levotiracetam, lamotrigine, valproic acid, you can get levels done on these fairly easily. Some sites might have them as send-out labs, so you might not get the results right away. But um, it's usually just for compliance purposes. Somebody comes in, they're having a seizure, they're like, nope, I take my Keppra every single day, I've never missed a dose. Well, let's do a level and see. Uh, maybe we need to increase your dose, or maybe it's not effective, or you're metabolizing it really quickly, who knows. Um, so you do a level, you check for compliance, you check for, but checking for efficacy is difficult because the drugs have such a wide therapeutic index that, like, well, the level is a little low, but it's not necessarily outside the realm of possibility. So do we increase the dose and increase the level? Well, there's no literature to support that that's an effective strategy for managing epilepsy. Now, you could certainly try it, and assuming you aren't getting um, overt adverse effects with that strategy, that might be fine. But for the most part, 
it's not something we do to assess efficacy. It's just something we do to assess compliance and to assess, okay, is this drug actually in the person's system to begin with? Let's start there, then we can work our way uh, with doses or adding other medications. Older adverse effects, and specifically, I'm really just talking about phenytoin here. Uh, that's probably the only one I can think of where they do pretty regular levels on it. Um, you can use it to check toxicity, and you can also target a specific therapeutic range. And I think, do I have it? No, I don't. Um, so this this uh, chart shows phenytoin range, and so it shows the range between 10 and 20. And the important thing to think, I think I used this as an example back in the like probably the first lecture, so it's probably long forgotten by now. But phenytoin has an exponential um, algorithmic curve uh, to it where it goes up quite quickly. So if you double the dose, so if your person comes back and they're at 10, their level, and you're like, well, their seizures aren't quite controlled, they're still having some epileptic events, let's double their phenytoin dose. So a doubling of the dose could end up bringing you, you know, way out here. So when you increase phenytoin, you have to increase very small amounts. So usually they'll do like, like let's say somebody's on 200 milligrams a day, they might increase by 25 milligrams. Um, and start there and go from there and check another level in a couple of weeks. So just to keep in mind, phenytoin is a weird drug. It doesn't have linear kinetics. It's one of the few examples out there that's like that in pharmacology. And it's one that we just can't simply double the dose, double the concentration. So if you remember that, that's all I really want you to know. I don't care that you know the therapeutic range, other than that phenytoin has got a narrow window. Your target's very small to hit, which makes it a bit challenging to dose. In healthy people, not too bad. In elderly patients who have variable protein binding, uh, might be eliminating things or metabolizing things differently. You can have a whole slew of other confounding variables that make the drug kind of challenging to work with. All right, I gave gabapentin and pregabalin in their own slide. I said these drugs, earlier I said these drugs aren't really used for epilepsy and they aren't. They were originally developed for epilepsy and they could theoretically be used as adjunct therapy for partial seizures. That's what they have indications for and our FDA approved for that. But people pretty much use them for neuropathic pain, general pain, so people just take these for all kinds of odd reasons that are pain related, um, RLS, restless leg syndrome, anxiety. We're going to talk about, hit some of these during the random neuro, so I'll go through this in a little bit more detail. Um, Gamapentins have been, become a super popular drug for anxiety. reason is because when you have somebody who's got anxiety and they want a quick fix for it, talk about anxiety later. Um, a lot of the drugs we use for that are addictive. So benzodiazepines are habit forming. They have, they're controlled. They have a lot of side effects with them as well. We don't want to get people on a regular benzodiazepine schedule. It's just, there's withdrawal issues. And anyway, we'll talk about that later. But the point is, is that people have been using gabapentin and pregabalin in place of that. And it seems to work. The interesting thing that we're seeing now is that gabapentin is thought to be it's thought that it's being abused in the community. So there's been, I've heard this for a couple of years now, so I don't know if that'll ever actually happen, but there's a lot of talk that gabapentin is going to become a controlled substance. Pregabalin or Lyrica is a controlled substance, C5. So they've got to prove that way. It's a newer version, basically pretty much the same thing as gabapentin, slightly different molecule. So, and they kind of work like anti-epileptic drugs. They just aren't great for seizure control, but they have a huge array of uses in other areas, um, specifically in these ones here. <coughs> Both are pretty well tolerated. The biggest side effect with these two medications is dose-related sedation and lethargy. So if you're titrating somebody, you just go up slowly. I've seen the weirdest, the gabapentin, just to give you an example, starting dose is usually like 100 milligrams three times a day. I've seen people on like 3,600 milligrams a day. So you get really big ranges of doses with it. And they, people tend to tolerate it okay. As long as you titrate it up, they don't get too sedated on it. Now, is that appropriate? That's another question, but I've seen it. <laughs> Okay, some newer drugs, and I don't think I have any questions on new drugs because I don't really know where they're being used. I can speculate, and I'll give you some speculation, but I'm not going to test you on them because I think it's just much more focused on the other. I would rather you focus on the drugs that you're going to see more commonly. Again, you might see these, and these might be the big drugs in five years. I don't know. Uh, but right now, you don't see these a whole lot. I think it's important to recognize their names. Like if you see one of these drugs pop up on a med list, you know it's an anti epileptic drug. So I'd keep that maybe for your own personal studying, but I won't test you on them. Um, s lit s s -li -car carbazepine, I think is how you pronounce that. You could probably tell that's part of the oxcarbazepine, carbamazepine family. Um, it's actually identical to oxcarbazepine, but it has a more blunt, blunted peak effect. So theoretically, it's going to cause less side effects over time and maybe be a bit more of a natural... Um, extended release process to it. Whether that's needed, I'm not sure. I think I've seen this on one or two patients. 
Uh, and we have a pretty big epilepsy unit at Abbott, so we do see some of the more complex cases, just not a super common medication. Um, the next one is actually probably out of, out of these ones for sure would be the most common one I've seen used, is um, river acetam or Briviac, which is a, kind of an analog to Keppra. Supposedly what this is, in a nutshell, is it's Keppra, but a lot more potent. So the ideal patient you might see this used on is somebody who might get a partial response to Keppra, <laughs> is on a high dose of it, uh, is not getting... Uh, seizure, the, the amount of seizure control desired. So you switch to this medication because, well, it's more potent version and uh, the side effect profile is a little bit different. The, the psych side effects aren't quite as pronounced from what I understand with it, uh, but still possible. So where this one falls into play, will this become the new Keppra in 10 years? It's possible. It might. It's definitely, again, one that we're seeing a lot of use of. But this, again, is falling first to being a controlled substance. So it's a C5 um, and it just came on the market and there, it seems like it's essentially used in the same place as Keppra. It's very similar molecule. So why didn't Keppra get a controlled status during during trials? We don't know. So I think the FDA is getting a lot more, cracking down a lot more on these drugs that you know a few people feel euphoric on during their clinical trials. Um, maybe in the past they didn't take that into consideration, but now they are, or at least they seem to be. <clears throat> Clobazam is actually a benzodiazepine analog. It's a long-acting medication um, that shouldn't theoretically cause as much sedation as a traditional benzodiazepine like Valium or, or Lorazepam or Ativan, but it's uh, it's an option for people as for general seizures. It's going to have uh, probably tried numerous other drugs unsuccessfully. So this drug should have a bit of an advantage as far as efficacy because it's a benzodiazepine, but also side effect profile wise, you have a lot of sedation that comes along with that. Impossible for withdrawal symptoms, which again we'll talk about in much more detail during psych. The other two drugs I, I don't know very much about at all. I've seen Ficampa. On one patient, I think we ordered it in specially. I haven't seen Potiga at all, so I'm not entirely sure other than that um, uh, Potiga is a potassium channel opener, so it's kind of got a different mechanism of action than some of the other ones. Um, Ficompa, I'm not sure why. It actually got a Schedule 3, which is pretty high. So that's the same schedule as, well, actually, those drugs aren't that schedule anymore. But it's just under an opioid and in between a benzodiazepine and an opioid. So that's a pretty high schedule to slap on something, so I'm not exactly sure why it got that high of a, a risk of abuse or diversion, but it did from the DEA. So, I don't know. Anyway, higher restrictions with that one. Okay, so let's talk about treatment a little bit. So if you have a generalized seizure disorder patient, your treatment plan is probably going to be looking at broad spectrum plus good side effect profile. So I would say, keeping in mind, lamotrigine and levetiracetam probably is your first two choices with dibalproex, topiramate, and zanisamide as kind of a second tier there. All of those are indicated and all would be acceptable to start. There's not a right answer here. It's just like if you told me I had seizures and said, what do you want to take? I'd pick the first two. It's just me after doing research. But, you know, you could have different opinions on that, you know, depending on who you're working with or, or what, what experience people have had with the drugs. <clears throat> if the drug's fully titrated and not effective, you're, you can either do one of two things, cross taper to another broad spectrum AED. So whenever we do AED, uh, changes, we're going to cross taper. So you're going to taper down off one and you're going to escalate on the other. And you want to do it sort of in concurrence so that you're hitting your peak dose with one and you're decreasing your dose off on the other at the same time. That's really difficult to do with lamotrigine because it takes such a long time, but that's why it's really important to cross taper on lamotrigine. It's going to take you a while to get all the way up to that dose. You really have to cross taper slowly on your other anti-epileptic to make sure that you still have some anti-seizure medication on board. As the odds are, even if this drug isn't working fully for you, it's providing some benefit, hopefully. And that would lead me to the other side of the coin here. Do you just add on another thing at that time? So the question is, if you're getting a, you know, why would you do one or the other? Why would you cross taper? Why would you add? I think I would probably recommend cross tapering if you're getting, even if you're getting efficacy, if the patient's experiencing significant side effects and just simply doesn't want to take the drug. If the patient's non-compliant, you're dead in the water to begin with. So that'd probably be a, uh, an opportunity to try cross tapering altogether and getting rid of the first agent. Um, you could consider dose reduction too. There's that idea as well, and then adding something. Um, if your drug's working and the side effects are tolerable, that's probably an add-on therapy where you try adding something on because you want to keep whatever benefit you're getting from that current AED and try adding something on. You could always try taking the drug off later. Um, so, and actually, there's some evidence, which is the final thing here is after two to four years of anti-epileptic drug use, if you're seizure-free, it is actually okay to trial off an AED. Now, 
I say okay loosely because you could have a patient who was having debilitating seizures that took forever to get control of, and maybe that's not a good candidate. But maybe you had a patient who had a handful of seizures, um, and you know they've been really well managed on one medication. They want to try getting off. Maybe they're on valproic acid and they want to get pregnant. Like, well, could I try without and see uh, for a year or so and see what happens? That's that that is actually clinically acceptable to do. So you don't have to keep somebody on something forever. But a lot of people will stay on an anti-epileptic drug forever because it's a risk-benefit scenario for you, the clinician, and also your patient as well. And some people, clinician and patient, both won't be comfortable with that situation. That's certainly okay. I just want to throw it out there that you can take people off anti-epileptic drugs if, you, if you'd like to and you think it makes sense for your patient. So um, that would be maybe the if you go back up a notch. So let's say we have somebody on two anti-epileptic drugs. So you get some effect with one. You add on another agent. You're getting full efficacy. It's been a couple years, the person's not doing great with the side effects, so maybe you try and take off that one drug you started with. So maybe you take them back to one drug and try that. You can always try playing around with these regimens, but the, the, you know, the, the risk, of course, is seizures. So, so you want to be careful with, with how aggressively you do it, and if you're ever going to remove a drug, slow titration off is always the best policy. Whole turkey is never a good option with an anti drug. Hopefully that's obvious, but just to, to say it, I think it's important. Yeah. The middle one there is that and or like cross patient. Yep, or yep. So that's a, uh, yeah, it's an yeah option depending on what direction you'd want to go clinically with the patient. Either one would be acceptable. And remember, you can if you want to add, you could consider anything. So anti-epileptic drugs are kind of interesting in the sense that they they're all really related as far as mechanism goes, but you can combine any of them with each other. Uh, so there's not like you know, you, you have to use certain ones together. They're all kind of one class, but they all work a little bit independently of each other. So you can really, you could have somebody on lamotrigine, levetiracetam, and divalprox. Uh, there's no clinical problem with that. Yes? Would you recommend switching uh, medication first or adding? Yeah, I think it just depends. And I'd say side effects would be the biggest thing I would think about with that, and how much how much benefit you're getting from the drug. If nothing's changed, if they're if you're fully titrated on your dose and they're still having the same amount of seizures, then I'd probably just get rid of it. But if they're maybe having half the seizures they had and their side effects are okay, I'd probably add. Um, if the patient's complaining of side effects, then I'd probably switch. Okay. Partial treatment, it's not really that different. Remember, broad spectrum work for generalized and partial. You can use for either one. Um, some of the drugs with a little bit more evidence and partial, and remember, I said these drugs were originally approved in partial, so that's the patient population they're studying. So levetiracetam and lamotrigine specifically have a lot more data behind um, use in partial seizures. So they're really more of the first-line agents here historically. And again, I would argue they're the first-line agents for any type of seizure disorder. But um, specifically for partial, you're going to see them come up as, as preferred agents. So it's not that different, um, really. Topiramate, I would say, and, and valproic acid just have a bit more of a side effect profile issue with them. And they're, they were more studied for um, general onset seizures, so that's why they aren't showing up on the initial monotherapy here. And I think that these three drugs probably are your best options as far as side effect profile goes and efficacy. So. Uh, and that's really the same thing here. Consider partial only adjuncts. Are there certain adjuncts you might try that are specifically approved for partial seizures uh, and have been studying that population? Um, and then cross tapering would be uh, something to do here. And same thing, trialing off after a couple of years seizure free if you want to. Opsance, uh, I'm not going to talk about this much. This is a odd type of generalized. It's usually pediatric only. And ethosexamide becomes the first line. So just that's all I really care about talking about upsonance. Otherwise, it's a generalized seizure disorder. The only thing you don't use is um, the ones here. So these drugs are contraindicated in upsonance seizures. Again, I'm not going to test you on upsonance, so don't worry about it. It's very rare. All right, special populations. Just want to recap some of the stuff I've talked about. Pregnancy. Um, newer AEDs are always preferred. So there's been a lot of big... Uh, I don't know if you call meta-analysis, just uh, retrospective analysis, probably a better word. So in, in places that have access to massive amounts of data, for example, like European countries where medicine is generally socialized, they can go back and say, okay, we have 200,000 patients that were pregnant and took anti epileptic drugs in the last 20 years. What drugs were they on and what rates of malformations have they had? And generally speaking, newer drugs... Um, the, the line included there, lamotrigine, levetiracetam, topiramate, and oxcarbazepine had better or lower rates 
than older drugs um, and valproic acid. So valproic acid, phenytoin, had worse outcomes in pregnancy than these ones. Now, I actually had a student, I guess, I don't know if you guys, have you had your epilepsy lecture from your other practitioner yet? Did they say topiramate's bad in pregnancy? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so topiramate's iffy in pregnancy, but this the specific um, retrospective did look at topiramate and said that it was generally safer than valproic acid or phenytoin, but it's still probably not a preferred agent. I would say if you cut topiramate out of there, those three are going to be your, your options that it would be ideal in a, in a pregnant patient. Um, studies generally show that those uh, agents, with maybe the exception of topiramate, um, when you take it out, show really no link to birth defects. So if you're on lamotrigine, levotiracetam, or oxycarbazepine during pregnancy, you have no risk higher than the general population who doesn't take anti-epileptic drugs of having a birth defect. So that's pretty reassuring evidence. And again, we've, they've looked at a lot of big pools of data because, again, seizures are devastating during pregnancy, so we can't have that happening. So it's a risk-benefit where the, the risk of taking the medication generally always is more beneficial than being off the medication and having a seizure. 4 to 6% of fetal malformations overall, early gestational exposure, higher doses, and polypharmacy increased risk in the major studies. So they found that the higher the dose you had, the more anti-epileptic drugs you were on, uh, bigger risk, which is not surprising. Um, children, virtually all drugs we mentioned today are useful in children and approved in children have been studied in children. Uh, formulations can be tricky, but a lot of them come in liquid, so you can dose for children pretty easily. Uh, dosing and kinetics are really all over the place with kids. We'll talk about peds during the summer, some dosing strategies for them, but you know, if you go into peds, it's just something to think about and start thinking about that your dosing is totally different than adult medicine. Um, Lennox Gestalt is an odd childhood seizure neurodevelopmental issue. Um, no drug is really helpful for this. You might hear it come up as far as epilepsy disorders or seizure disorders, but um, some drugs have been studied, but nothing's been found to be all that effective in Uh Brand versus generic. So <clears throat> I'll bring this up. Normally, this isn't something we care about. We prescribe generic and we want generics because they're cheaper, they're more effective. It saves everybody money on every side of the health system. Um, but remember, an 80 to 125 percent variance is possible manufacturer to manufacturer. So and by that I mean you could have one that's 80% of the label claim and one that's 100% of the label claim. So that could be a 20 milligram dose difference. Now hopefully a reputable manufacturer is going to have internal standards that are much tighter than that, but you never really know. FDA would require this specific standard on there. So uh, this was a big deal when a lot of the newer AEDs like Keppra, Lamotrigine were going generic because people were saying we need to keep them on their brand names. And actually, there's some legislation proposed in Minnesota that fortunately didn't go through that was actually going to require pharmacies to continue to dispense brand name only product to patients and make it illegal for them to switch unless their provider authorized it, which would have cost people a lot of money, especially when insurance companies would have been pushing the other way. It would have been a really sticky situation. Fortunately, that didn't go through, but the, the risk is still there. So you might get some patients where they're on a brand name only anti-epileptic and they just won't switch. They probably tried switching and maybe they just, they had side effects with it. So you never really know what your variance is going to be. And it's a little bit of a gamble, especially with drugs that are anti-epileptic. It's, uh, you know, a slight dose adjustment can have a big impact. So generally speaking, wide therapeutic index, a little bit difference in Keppra probably won't make a big difference. A little bit of a difference in phenytoin could make a huge difference. So that uh, in, in how the seizures are controlled. So just something to keep in mind, uh, and that's really all I have to say. There's not really any evidence to support this. A lot of it's anecdotal and provider preference and patient preference, but um, they've done studies on this and haven't showed really any clinical variance between generic and brand formulations as far as ultimately the clinical impact on this, but um, you still might see it come up more so in this subpopulation and disease state than other ones we've talked about so far this year. And just to sum up, uh, another slide that's helpful, and I don't care that you know this slide uh, for the purpose of this exam, but this is just different drugs out there that are associated with um, seizures. We've talked about some of these already. So we talked about beta-lactam antibiotics generally, one of the big ones for people who uh, would accumulate um, like for renal dysfunction patients, if you overdose them on something benign like ampicillin, you don't think of that as causing side effects. Well, if you do accumulate it, you can get seizures with it. Some antidepressants, we'll talk about these during psych. Um, antipsychotics, we'll mention briefly. The rest of these, they're just really here for your reference in case you're curious. General anesthetic, methohexital, uh, 
is a induction agent for anesthesia. They actually use that sometimes to help induce seizures for electroconvulsive therapy, like ECT patients. So sometimes they use these things to their advantage. Ketamine as well, they'll use for that reason too, to get a better seizure. We'll talk about ECT a little bit during psych as well, but I'm getting a little bit outside the scope of this lecture. But again, this is just here for your reference and uh, there for you to review if you're curious. But that's all I have. Any questions on AEDs? Okay. So next week we'll talk about Parkinson's and finish up neuro with a couple shorter topics, but should be a relatively short lecture next week as well. I'll post the cases this week, give you some time in case you want to ask questions next week. I won't plan on going through them specifically, but it'll be available in case you're interested.